Hi everyone, welcome to the Facebook Live. My name's Chris Thorogood and I'm a botanist and I work here at Oxford Botanic Garden. And today we're going to look at some really exciting plants. So we're going to be taking a look at the killers of the plant kingdom. Um, so these green predators have evolved various means of enticing, trapping, killing and digesting animal prey. Um, so these are the parts that have really turned the tables on the animal kingdom. I'm holding a few interesting examples in my hand. So let's take a deeper dive and look at some of these interesting hunters in the plant kingdom. Um, we're going to look specifically at two groups of killer plants today. Um, the so-called pitcher plants, which have evolved pitfall traps, um, and the flypaper traps as well, so things like sundews. And these have evolved some really interesting uh, strategies for, for trapping animals to supplement their diet in nutrient-poor conditions. Um, so let's take a look at, at some of these plants. So if we start off with the the pitcher plants then. So this is a very simple one and, and some of you may not think that this looks like a carnivorous plant. Um, this is a, a sort of bromeliad, it's actually a relative of the pineapple. Um, it's a kind of tank plant and this is one of the most simple of, of the carnivores. It's evolved a, a tightly bound rosette of leaves that form a sort of cup and they collect rainwater and insects that slip in and drown and fall within uh, the, the tightly bound leaf rosette um, they decompose with the, the help of bacteria that live inside this pool of water and then the nutrients that are released then nourish the plant. So that's a, a very simple example of a carnivorous pitcher plant, um, but they get far more complicated than this. This is a, another one that's called a heliamphora. Um, so I've just uh, picked one off here. So this is the, the trap itself, the pitcher. Um, this is also a fairly simple uh, trap that is essentially a leaf that is folded and, and forms a, a tube and it's fused along the front here um, and this tube also collects water now this one grows in very very wet conditions on mountain tops in South America um, and because um, it grows in, under such wet conditions it actually has a little overflow at the top here to, to stop it from getting too full now what you won't be able to see, because they're so small, are the tiny little hairs that coat the inner surface. And these become wet and slippery, and little insects parachute down those tiny wet slippery hairs into a pool of liquid at the bottom. And like the, the previous example, there are bacteria in there that help break up these little insects that fall in and drown, and then release nutrients that, that feed the plant. So that's another example of a pitcher plant. And they again become more complex than that. So this is a, a North American pitcher plant, or, or a Saracenia. Um, and this is also a, a folded tubular leaf. Um, and this is also a, a trap um, that produces nectar at the top, rather like you get in, in flowers, a sweet nectar that, that insects like to feed on. And they're also attracted to the bright colour of, of the pitchers. And they land um, on this frilly part here and crawl around and feed on the nectar and as they do so, they slip on this very slippery rim here, and then they tumble down into the pool of liquid below, where they're digested by enzymes, um, which break down the, the soft parts of the insect and release the nutrients that then feed the plant. And we've got a wonderful example here um, of a, a Saracenia flava, so one of these North American pitch plants. Isn't that just... Fantastic. Now this one is, is really sinister in fact because not only does it attract, digest and, and kill insect prey like the other examples, but there's evidence to suggest that this one has um, within the nectar that the insects feed on um, a, a sort of narcotic, narcotic um, called conine that basically intoxicates the insects and it makes them far more likely to, to behave in a way that, that means that they'll tumble into the pitcher and, and drown and, and feed the plant. So that's a, a slightly sinister but I think fantastic example of, of a carnivore in, in the plant kingdom. Um, so these two are, are related then um, and Another um, pitcher plant in the same lineage as, as these um, is this one, which is called a cobra lily. Um, and you can see why, because it looks a little bit like a, like a snake's head. Um, now this one has a, a really interesting strategy for trapping insects. So there is a little entrance hole on the underneath here, and the insects crawl into this hooded chamber. And what you may be able to see, if we can zoom in perhaps... Um, are the little 
transparent windows that it has at the top of the picture, and these transmit light into this inflated chamber at the top here. Now the insects have become disoriented inside this chamber and they, they can't find the, the entrance hole by which they came into the picture and um, they constantly crawl or fly towards those transparent patches thinking that those are the exits for the picture. So they're, they're effectively false exits. And these insects eventually become exhausted in trying to escape through those and then tumble into the abyss below, into that pool of digestive liquid where they, they then drown, they um, decompose and they're broken down and the nutrients released are then absorbed by the plant. Um, so this is a really in interesting strategy um, that has evolved for, for trapping insects. And now we'll move on to an even more complicated pitcher plant. Um, which may be familiar um, to some of you watching. So this is an Apenthes pitcher plant, and I think they're particularly beautiful. These evolved um, in Southeast Asia uh, predominantly. This one is um, Nepenthes sanguinea, um, so it grows in some of the mountaintops of Peninsular Malaysia. And these extraordinary traps are actually very intricate, far more so researchers now know than, than we used to. And it's, it's much more elaborate than insects just tumbling in and then drowning at the bottom, and, and we'll soon see why. Um, so if we take a closer look at what's going on here, you'll see a tendril here. That's an extension that basically the end of which then develops this elaborate trap in which insects predominantly are attracted um, to the pitcher because, again, of its colour and its, its smell. And they, they climb up and they visit this outer rim, this purple shiny part here. Now, again, what you can't see um, is that it has a very um, intricate microtopography, um, which essentially forms a, a liquid film, a lubricating liquid film, that means insects... Um, will slip down from this rim into the pitcher below. So it's effectively it's been described as insect aquaplaning. They aquaplane off this slippery rim because of the film of liquid that forms by condensation on the rim, and then they tumble into the pitcher below. But more than that, the, the inner surface of the pitcher is actually covered in, a, in a, a, a waxy layer. And this clogs up the claws, the tarsi of the insects. Um, so if they try to climb out, they find that their claws get clogged up with wax. Um, and that means that, they, again, they, they find um, real difficulty in trying to exit the trap. Um, and so they tumble down into the pool of liquid below. And for some species, it gets even more complex because the trapping mechanism also includes the liquids, the digestive liquids at the bottom of the trap, because these have a property known as viscoelasticity. These viscoelastic fluids, um, they're, they're made up of um, complex polysaccharides, which means they're sort of sticky, effectively, and stringy. And this means that as the insect tries to free itself from the liquid, it becomes dragged down by the liquid, which draws it into the body of the pitcher. Um, and again, this enhances the trapping mechanism. So we've seen that the insects that are attracted to the smell and the nectar, they slip off the top here, they tumble into the pitcher, they can't climb out because of the waxy layer on the inside, and then they get stuck in that sticky liquid at, at, at the bottom of the pitcher. Um, so together, this creates a very effective trapping mechanism in, in this pitcher plant. And what I'd like for us to do is actually take a closer look at this by cutting one open. So this is a, a Nepenthes pitcher, so you can see here very clearly it has a lid, which is involved in attracting the insects and also prevents too much rain from entering the pitcher, which would dilute the, the liquid at, at the bottom. You can see the purple rim at the top, um, which is very, very slippery. Um, and again, this is where that film of liquid forms that the insects climb onto and then slip and tumble down into the body of the pitcher. And rather than take my word for it, let's cut one open and have a look inside this trap. And I may well get a little bit wet here, because you can see all the liquid there uh, that has collected in the pitcher. And what we'll see, <laughs> and this is a wonderful example, which I didn't know was going to be quite so good as it, as it is. But perhaps we can zoom in, because it's absolutely full of, of dead ants, which is fantastic. So rather than take my word for it, you can see that this hungry plant has, has really done its job and, and attracted numerous ants which have fallen to the bottom of, and drowned. Um, you can just about hopefully make out 
this waxy bloom at the top, that's the slippery part that I mentioned. And then you probably can't see, but this layer here is studded with tiny black dots. These are the digestive glands that absorb the nutrients that the dead bodies of these ants release and, and feed the plant. Um, so that's a fantastic example, I think, of, of a carnivore. Um, and some, some of these Nepenthes pitcher plants have evolved even more elaborate um, forms of nutrient acquisition strategy um, beyond feeding on, on insects. There are some fascinating examples, particularly in Borneo, um, of pitcher plants that house um, roosting bats um, and the bats seek protection by living inside the, um, or roosting inside the pitchers, and then they excrete into the pitchers, and the droppings then feed the plant. So some of these plants have evolved even more elaborate means of, of um, acquiring nutrients in nutrient-poor environments than, than these insect-eating ones. So a fascinating example um, of, of mutualism in, in some of those plants as well. So those are the Nepenthes pitcher plants. Um, one that you may not know so well, um, perhaps we can zoom in on, on this little trap here. Um, this is called Cephalotus, it's a, an Australian pitcher plant. Um, it's very much underexplored, not many people have, have paid too much attention to this plant versus some of the others, so we don't know as much about the trapping mechanism, interestingly. Um, but what's fascinating about this plant is that you can see it looks very, very similar to the um, Nepenthes pitcher plant that we looked at, um, which I've rather destroyed. Um, but you can probably see that it shares that, that rim at the top there. It also has a lid um, and, and this pitcher-like chamber. Um, and what's really interesting to note is that this Australian pitcher plant is not at all related to that Nepenthes one. And those two pitcher plants in turn are not at all related to the North American um, pitcher plants and the ones from South America I showed you. So those are three different examples um, of evolution of pitcher plants that are independent. They're not related, um, but they have evolved in very nutrient-poor environments, which has driven a certain selection pressure. So that means that um, there's a strong drive um, towards keeping these traps to feed the plant um, that gives it a competitive advantage in an environment where nutrients are, are scarce. So if we now take a look at um, a different group of carnivores, um, and a rather beautiful one at that. Um, so these are the sundews, as, as you may know, and the drosera. And perhaps we can just zoom in on, on the, these leaves here. And can you see that gluey substance? Is that working? Excellent. So that, that sticky substance here, and you can see it's stuck to me, um, that is very attractive um, to, to insects. In fact, the name drosera actually means dew. And, and its English name, sundew, as well, refers to these dewy leaves. Now, the insects, they alight the surface of the leaf, and, of course, they become stuck by this, this gluey um, material. Um, and the more they try and free themselves, the more stuck they become in, in that, that gluey material. And then the leaf actually undergoes um, a curling response, and you can see one there that's actually curled around an insect and effectively suffocates um, the, the insect um, and then digests um, the nutrients that, that that produces, which then nourishes um, the plant. So very beautiful, but also, again, rather sinister. And we have another example of, of this. Um, is this one here. So this is a, a drosophyllum. Um, it was once thought to be very closely related to Drosera because it's so similar. It is a relative, but it's not as closely related as, as perhaps we, we once thought. This one doesn't undergo the same curling response, but it has a similar gluey leaf, um, which, which is very, very effective at catching insects. And I don't know if you can see, because they're quite small, but maybe we can zoom in on, on those. And you can see it's absolutely covered in little flies. This is very rare in the wild. So this one grows in parts of Spain, Portugal and, and Morocco. I've seen whole glades of these, but they're, they're very rare and, and, um, and protected. Um, they were long um, dug up by carnivorous plant enthusiasts, and that, that means they're quite rare in their, their natural habitat, um, but a lovely plant nonetheless. Um, and I think then it would be interesting to talk about how some of these plants evolved. So as I mentioned before, what all these carnivorous plants here have in common is that they evolved in nutrient-poor environments, so environments where essential nutrients like nitrogen and phosphorus are rather scarce. So often 
waterlogged peaty environments or rocky surfaces that are, that are drenched by rain and they leach out all the nutrients. And that's where these carnivorous plants typically grow. And that is very important because that's driven, as I said, strong selection pressures um, for evolving these intricate traps um, that lure, digest um, and, and kill insect prey because these insects then supplement the diet of these plants in environments where they can't necessarily access the nutrients that, that plants in other places are able to. But, but again, how did such intricate traps actually manage to evolve? Um, for example, something like this. Um, it can be quite hard to conceptualise how, how an Apenthes pitcher um, that's so complex and so different to other plants could ever have evolved. Um, well, actually, a lot of, um, or some of the answers have been provided um, through DNA analysis. So, um, at a time um, before DNA um, sequencing was, was uh, prevalent and used by scientists, the origins of some of these plants was actually quite unclear. Um, and some scientists, for example, thought that pitcher plants um, are, all, are all related and came from one common ancestor um, because how could such a, an intricate mechanism of attracting and digesting insects have evolved more than once? Um, but we now know that it has evolved multiple times and we know that actually this pitcher plant here is much more closely related to this drosera, this sundew, than it is to these North American pitcher plants here. So, so how is that possible? Well, what we think happened is that a, a sticky, hairy leaf um, may have, um, have fused and formed a cup-like like structure, which was more effective at retaining insect prey that had been caught. And, and then further selection would have enhanced um, the, the trapping device um, towards um, the, the pitcher shape that, that, that we see today. And actually, if we look at other plants in, in the plant kingdom, we can see that it's not such a big jump to produce a tubular structure. So this is a, a codium, um, a relative of the euphorbias. And you'll see that it's produced by mutation, this tendril-like um, uh, structure, and then this part that's a little bit like a tube here. And actually, if we look at um, the tendril and the, the appendage of this pitcher um, versus this codium, you'll see it's not a million miles away. And so if you take something hairy and sticky like a, a dross relief that then folds up, becomes tubular, um, perhaps by similar mechanisms to how this leaf um, is, is produced, you can start to see that that might be a pathway to the evolution um, of a pitcher. And I think what we'd like to end on um, is a plant that we all know and love, I imagine, um, it's a, a Venus flytrap, of course. Um, this one is actually a distant relative of, of the sundews that we looked at already. And I think the most fantastic thing about this Venus flytrap is that it can count. Um, so hopefully it will behave for us and, and we'll see that. Um, so this is the, the trap here. Now, as well as this fringe of spines around the edge, you may be able to see, but they're very small, um, a set of little tiny hairs that are on the inner surface of, of the lobes here. Now, if these are touched once, the trap does nothing. Um, and that's really um, to avoid the trap enclosing things like leaf litter or inanimate objects, that it doesn't want to waste its energy um, closing up and, 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 and absorbing. But if you touch it more than once in succession, it generates um, a response that causes the trap to close. So let's see if we can make that happen now. So touch it once, nothing happens, touch it again, oh, and then and there we go, and it's, <laughs> and it's, it got me. So in case you missed that, I'll just try and do it again. Let's find a, a healthy looking one. That's a new one, so they should work. Touch it again, and there we go, and it closes in that instantaneous um, response. And what will happen there is it, it partially closes, and any insect that's tiny and it's not worth the plant bothering with, effectively, can still climb out through those gaps. But if it's a, um, a decent sized insect, then it will be maintained within this chamber and then the plant undergoes a, another um, response that enables it to close really, really tightly. And maybe you can see that one there. It's formed a sort of pouch. Effectively, that's a stomach. Um, so it, it's, it's sealed um, around the insect and then it pumps out its digestive juices, digests the soft part of the insect, absorbs the nutrients, and then after a couple of weeks, the trap then um, opens again, the dry remains, the exoskeleton um, of, the, of the insect then blows away 
um, and, and then the trap is resprung um, to catch another insect. Um, now, please do ask questions, and I see we've had um, one come in already. So this is a, an interesting question. What's the largest animal found in a, in a carnivorous plant? Um, now, there is a, a, a carnivorous pitcher plant, so a, a relative of, of these guys, called Nepenthes raja. Um, and I um, have been lucky enough to go and see this in its natural habitat in Borneo. And it grows on these landslides on, on the side of the mountain. And it has these enormous traps um, about this big, these giant pitchers, um, which are just fantastic. And you, and you stand in this grove of pitcher plants on this mountainside. It's, it's wonderful. Now, this is the largest of all um, the carnivorous plants. And occasionally, you actually find um, the bodies of dead rodents um, in, these, in these traps. Now, it's more complicated than this. The rodents actually feed on the nectar produced by the trap, um, which in most other species attracts insects. Um, and whilst it feeds on the nectar, rather like the bat example I talked about earlier, it then excretes into the pitcher and the droppings from the tree shrew that's feeding on it, um, they, they then feed the pitcher. And if the tree shrew happens to fall in, and in some cases rats as well, um, then so be it, and then they, they can drown and then feed the plant. So whilst the, the plant doesn't specifically attract um, mammals to kill them and digest them, as we now know, they are sometimes found, found in there. So you could then argue that a rat is the largest animal that, that's found in a, in a carnivorous plant trap. Um, so do feel free to write down any more questions that you have, and um, I'll do my best to get back to you um, after the live video and, and answer those for you. But thanks for joining.